Um, and it seems like that argument, it, your argument has, you know, you're, you're hearing that echo and Adam Grant and others are big critics of, of Myers-Briggs and others. And so this yeah, is the Myers-Briggs has, has no predictive validity with regards to job placement, for example, but it's used in corporate settings very, very frequently. So when you think of the big five, when you think of this, this course, we've talked about the relationship with parents to their kids, a bit yep. about the relationship with somebody you, you might date or, or, or a partner. Um, how can this help um, uh, leaders? How does oh, it help that's, in the, that's in the workplace? Great, well, one of the things that it can help you understand is who you should select for hiring. You know, if you're hiring managers and administrators, you want people with high cognitive power, and that's, so that's associated with openness to experience, intellect, and IQ. You want people with high cognitive power, especially as the job complexity increases. Um, uh, low complexity jobs, which are ones that you can learn and then do by rote. They don't require so much general cognitive ability. But if you're hiring people to stay on top of a dynamically changing environment and they need to learn and make complex decisions, then you have to hire for general cognitive ability. And the difference economically between making the proper hiring decision and the improper hiring decision is overwhelming. It's going to make or break your enterprise. And then if you want manager and managerial and administrative types, you also want to hire for conscientiousness. And so if you use a, an amalgam of general cognitive ability and conscientiousness, you can hire with, you can improve your hiring accuracy. Well, you can imagine your failure rate is 50% in that 50% of the people that you hire are below average and 50% are above. It's just an arbitrary cutoff. If you use a decent selection process, then you can decrease your error in hiring by 50%. And so that will definitely make or break your business. And then if you also might need to hire entrepreneurial and creative types, depending on what they might be doing. Um, but certainly you, you want a, an interleaving of entrepreneurial and creative types in your enterprise so that you have people who can think laterally so that when the situation around you changes radically, you'll have people who can generate new ideas. And the managerial and, managerial and administrative types aren't good at that. They're good at implementing what's already been formulated. Right? They're the, if there's a forest and the trees, then the managers and administrators are focusing at the level of the trees. And the entrepreneurial types, the creative types, are focusing at the level of the forest. And they're going to be frustrating, the creative types, because they're not going to be great at detailed implementation. But you need to understand that it's not easy to find someone who brings all of the positive elements of all of the traits to bear simultaneously. You know, if you, sure. if you, every time you pick a dimension along which you're going to select, you decrease the number of people who are qualified. Like, let's say you want someone who's real smart, top 10%. Well, you've eliminated 90% of your applicant pool. Then if you want someone who's in the top 10% of conscientiousness, you've eliminated 90% of your high cognitive applicant pool. And so you're down to 10% of 10%. You're down to one in 100 people with only two dimensions. Then if you also want someone who's extroverted, well, you're facing exactly the same problem. So, um, so what that means is you're not going to get everything in one person. You're going to need a diverse range of people. And you, you extrapolate this out in the course in a, in a really significant way because you look at the failure of companies, even really large companies, yep. and what that kind of catastrophic collapse can be because people don't understand. Well, yes, and that's partly the part of what's discussed in the course is the radical difference in productivity between individuals. And that's something that's, well, it's quite, a, it's quite shocking to understand that that's the case, that in most enterprises, it's a minority of people who are doing the majority of the productive work. And that, well, that you, that you need to know that that's the case, that you need to hire to try to find more people like that, that you need to identify who those people are. And here's another thing that like managers often don't understand this. Say you have 10 people working for you. Let's say you have 100 people working for you and five of them are in trouble in one way or another, right? So they cause interpersonal trouble or they're having a crisis in their life or a series of ongoing crises in their life. Um, the managers generally spend the most of their time with the employees that have the most amount of trouble. And that's exactly the opposite of what you want to do if you want to increase corporate productivity. Is what you do is you find your best employees and you spend all your time with them. So and that's that that isn't what people do and it's 
and that it's economically counterproductive. It's partly because as a manager, you're not likely to be able to solve the problems of the people that you have who have problems. You just don't have the time or the expertise to manage it, generally speaking. Plus, it's extremely difficult. Now, that doesn't mean that if you run a company, you should ignore the people within your company that have or are causing problems. If they're causing problems, you might think about not having them. If they're having problems, well, then, you know, people are going to vary throughout their life to the, in the degree to which they're having problems, and you want to set up your company so that there are support mechanisms in place for people who are in yeah. temporary crisis. How, how do you answer the 